Welcome to Somerville Live Wire. I'm Mary Ellen Muir. Well, it's back to school time and we are back to school and what a difficult time it's been for the last year and a half. So we wanted to check in with people who are involved with the school. What's going on? How is it going? What would you like to see changed? Um, and, you know, just kind of a general check in because I know it's been a very emotional and um, fraught issue for so many people throughout the community. And for those of us like me that don't have children, um, we're kind of watching from the sidelines um, and getting feedback from our friends and um, neighbors about what's going on. So we wanted to check in with a couple of people. So we're joined first by Sarah Phillips, who is a school committee member, as well as Tim McCormick, who is a parent. So I wanted to, first of all, thank you both very much for joining us. Sarah, if we could begin with you, tell us a little bit, first of all, about your position, how long you've been on the school committee, and then we can go into how is it going. Sure. Um, so I represent Ward 3 on Somerville School Committee. I was first elected to office in 2019. So I took office in January of 2020. I had two whole months before it was all pandemic all the time. And now I'm running for a second term. Okay. So from your perspective, so what, what did you have to do as the, what did the school committee do um, in preparation for um, the opening here? I mean, obviously you've been thinking about it for months and months and months, but um, more recently, what were the actual action steps that you had to take? For the, this fall's reopening or yeah. for last year's reopening? For this fall's reopening. For this fall's reopening, most of the systems and the structures were already in place because of last year. And so the school committee didn't really need to do very much. We are, um, we sign all union contracts. And so we had to work with our different unions to make sure that any changes to working conditions from last year carried over to this year with whatever tweaks um, was our main role. And then, you know, just giving input and feedback uh, as we kind of move forward through the process. So the policy decisions were all made last year. Is that I correct? apologize. I'm forgetting about one policy, which is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> which is passing um, a vaccine mandate for staff, which was already in the teachers union contract um, that we had negotiated earlier, um, but it extended it to all staff and partners. And then a vaccine mandate for students who wanted to engage in non-academic extracurriculars. And we passed those right at the beginning of the year. Okay, and how um, difficult was that? I mean, was the entire school committee in agreement or was there a lot of um, discussion and negotiation about it? How did that go? It was not very difficult um, at the time. So we passed it at the end of August um, and it's a pretty soft mandate um, to the extent. So for adults, it's get vaccinated or get tested every week and wear a KN95 mask or the equivalent high grade surgical mask. But all the adults in our schools are getting tested every week. So it's a pretty, it's a soft mandate, but we know that the adults in our schools, like the adults in Massachusetts, really want to get vaccinated. We are just about to start um, collecting actual documentation of everyone's vaccination status. They have until October 20th, I believe, um, to demonstrate that they're fully vaccinated. So we're expecting very high results, but we will see after that um, if we need to take further action. And on the student side, um, because extracurriculars are optional, um, you know, the choice to participate in extracurriculars meant that students had to agree to get vaccinated if they're of age and participate in the testing program, the COVID-19 um, surveillance testing program, which is optional this year. Um, so neither of those were particularly hard to pass. There were some questions on the school committee about were we giving kids enough time? You know, if you decide in January to participate in a sport and we send an October 20th deadline, what does that mean for you? Do we give you enough time to get vaccinated? Um, yeah. But I think where we ended up was good and, and it passed unanimously. Okay, and you have a meeting, you had a meeting on September 2nd. Um, did you talk a lot about the, you know, how things were going um, at that time? Um, or are you focused more on the budget or what's the focus of discussion on the committee right now? Um, right now, we got a very long presentation on the COVID um, testing program. And we had a long discussion about COVID testing 
uh, at this week's meeting, we are gearing up to evaluate the superintendent, which is um, uh, you know one of the big tasks of the school committee. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Okay, great. All right. Well, that's very interesting. And, you know, obviously, um, probably not what you expected when you initially <laughs> ran for the office. So that's pretty exciting. So Tim, how's it been for you? Tell us about your child and tell us about your experience with um, school opening this fall. Yeah, so I have a six year old. Um, she uh, uh, started uh, so in the Somerville Public Schools uh, last year uh, in kindergarten um, and it was uh, all remote. We kept her remote for the, the, the fall and the spring. Uh, it actually worked out really well for us. Um, I, I know that, that that was not true for all parents and I, I absolutely understand that. Um, uh, we actually had a pretty good experience with that and we really appreciated uh, overall uh, Somerville's uh, commitment to, to doing things uh, uh, well in terms of the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, this this year, uh, things were a bit different. And uh, we were uh, having a lot of trouble at the uh, very end of the summer and the beginning of the semester, getting enough information to make a decision with uh, whether to send her back to school or do homeschooling or something else, we weren't really sure. Uh, so that's been a, a very difficult decision for us. So uh, tell us a little bit about the communication process. You know, again, for those of us who don't have um, children, we don't even know what are all the, you know, what what are the decisions that need to be made? Who are you hearing from? What are the, you know, how is the communication going out? Is it email and so forth? How does all of that, and what school, um, um, is your child um, attending? She's at Winter Hill, uh, Winter Hill Community School. And uh, yeah, the, the, the information comes in primarily via email. There's uh, district-wide emails. There's uh, emails from the principal of Winter Hill. Um, and then of course, from the, her, her uh, homeroom teacher. Uh, the, there have been communication issues in the past, which um, I would mostly characterize as a high degree of repetition of information, which I understand is a trade-off that they need to make because not everyone reads every email. Um, and that, that was just something I you know, came to be able to deal with once I understood how that worked. Um, <laughs> I was got better at skimming the parts that, that I had already read. Um, the communication issues we've had this year is that uh, the COVID uh, management policies changed since uh, since the spring, and a lot of that I think uh, has come down from the state, not from Somerville. Um, but we only found out about a lot of these changes right at the end of the summer, and so then we've had this mad scramble of. We don't feel like we're getting enough information from these these emails, which which were also late, uh, and then trying to get in touch with various people at the school, at the district, and at the state level uh, by so, via phone and email. So tell us specifically, like what were the things that you felt were the mad scramble? You know, I mean, were, were, were there safety issues? Were they you know scheduling issues? What were your, what were your concerns? My concerns were around safety. Um, we were, uh, like I said, very happy with the remote option, and we were trying to evaluate. Okay, do we do we want to do the the fully in person thing this year? Um, what are the like? There had been information last year about how the ventilation systems had been improved in various schools and uh, upgraded to meet certain specifications, but we couldn't actually find out what those specifications were. There's a lot of places that are saying we've made improvements to our HVAC systems, but they don't say whether it's like, oh, we cleaned it and replaced a filter, or we increased the fresh air mix, or we've put in HEPA filters and ensured a certain air changes per hour. Uh, and those are, you know, there's a huge amount of variation there. And while I overall trust Somerville to do the right thing, 
it was hard to figure out if they were in fact actually doing the right thing in this case. Um, uh, okay, so now that's interesting because from my perspective or from what I've read, Somerville has been one of the most careful and cautious school districts in the state. In fact, there was a parents organization set up last year, which I'm sure you know about it, is that they were parents who absolutely wanted in-person learning, you know, right away, and they were really pushing for it. So, you know, where do you think you are on the continuum, you know, of parents? And, you know, what do you hear from other parents? Well, I mean, first, first I want, I, I do want to say that I think Somerville has been doing, like, probably the best job of any district I've heard about. Uh, most of my complaints about um, actual decisions are things that are being imposed by the state um, and, and, and that I recognize this is not within Somerville's control. Uh, other parents, uh, it's, it's a real mix. I mean, a lot of people want their kids to be in school uh, full time, even if they're not totally comfortable with the measures, just because they don't really have a choice in terms of childcare, uh, uh, or I, I, this isn't something I've I've heard specifically, but I know that there's a lot of food insecurity in the community, and a lot of kids yeah. get a lot of their food at the school, and yeah. uh, those are those are real trade offs people have to make. Uh, I've heard of, I've heard a mix. Uh, yeah. Besides that, of of what how comfortable people are. Uh, so ultimately, where what where is your child? Is your child in school, attending school? So we uh, so eleven hours before the start of school, we got an email. Um, uh, I I don't remember exactly which one this was. Um, I I think this was the email saying that. Uh, the, I'm sorry, I'll have to think about this for a moment. Well, we're waiting with bated breath. Is she yeah. going to school? <laughs> yeah, no, she, uh, about, about 24 hours ago, we finally made, made the decision to, to send her to school. We had, we had already, uh, been, looking up homeschooling resources and all these other things. And it was, uh, it was honestly uh, an extremely close decision. Yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah. Were, we were absolutely sure we were gonna have to homeschool her because we, had, we felt we had no way of getting the information we needed. And at the last minute, I was actually able to get a really good phone call with Principal Gosselin at Winter Hill, got the information I needed, um, figured out some compromises we could make and we were able to to make that decision if, if I hadn't been able to reach her that day she would have been homeschooled okay yeah which is great because I mean obviously in your case you kind of liked the remote school and that actually worked for um for your family and it did um you it know would have been a so lot of work <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, good. teachers just... work hard <laughs> that's yeah I'm, that's I'm a like... surprise I have, now, I have no illusions there. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> sister is a teacher. I actually called her last night um, uh, to talk about this. She's down in Arizona, and I was telling her that I was going to be interviewing a parent and a um, and a school committee member. And I said, "What should I ask the school committee?" And she said, "Well, ask her whether she supports public schools or wants to dismantle them for private school." And I was like, "I don't think we have to do that here in Somerville." <laughs> so that was pretty funny. I was like, "Oh, a different starting point for sure." Um, so, Sarah, are you hearing, you know, lots of reservations from parents or are there pressures from the parents who wanted to open up, you know, because, you know, the other thing is, is there, you know, a remote backup plan in case the numbers go up? What's the, you know, situation with that? Mostly I'm, I'm hearing a lot of relief from parents, like we are finally back full time. We can go to work, our kids are safe, the school has put so many things in place. That's what I hear most often. I also hear some concerns about the testing program, some of the changes. So the testing program this year is different than last year's. Last year we had a system built for the Somerville Public Schools and the Medford Public Schools by Tufts, and it was fantastic. This year we're enrolled in the state system. It's not quite as good um, and people are not quite as happy. Um, 
And is that when you say it's not when you say it's not quite as good, is that because it's not as efficient or, um, you know, what is it about it that you feel like that isn't working as well? My understanding is it's just kind of built as a glitchy system. So I don't know if any of your viewers have gotten kind of a test by CIC Health. Um, you paid and gone. They just have a glitchier system um, than other places like just signing in, et cetera. So for example, okay. the consents, for example, there wasn't initially a way for the district to download the consents in like a CSV or an Excel file to see which kids had consented to participate. And they needed okay. CIC to build that for them so they could track how many people had consented and and, and work to improve that. Um, right, and right. then this yeah. year, uh, participating in testing is optional. Last year, it was mandated. So yeah. parents are concerned about, I hear concerns about that. There's just general fear about what's going to happen with Delta. Um, yeah. The first couple of weeks of school, we've continued to have very few cases, positive cases, and the trends are looking similar to the beginning of school last spring. But we're all concerned, you know, we all want our kids right. to be safe. And, and I think parents are concerned about that. Right. So if the numbers do go up, do you have a plan for going back to remote then? And Unfortunately, what the state has mandated that remote schooling no longer counts as schooling and you can't receive your chapter 70 funding, your state education uh, aid, if you're doing remote schooling, unless you have like an approved remote school. So the state is right now saying, nope, that's not an option. Um, and we will see how we have to deal with that as things evolve. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I posted this question about how is it going on um, social media? And um, one of the responses I got back, um, which I thought I'm just going to read the response and give you both a chance to react to it. Um, I teach high school in a different district, but live in Somerville. Oh, this is a teacher, sorry. My colleagues and I are so happy to be back to fully in-person teaching. It's great to see my students, except the lower half of their faces, and to watch students interact with each other, do group work, make new friends, et cetera. The number one way I think more money can improve education is to decrease class size. I'm able to get to know students so much better and offer more individual assistance. When I have fewer in the room, it also allows me to spend more time giving feedback on each student's projects, lab or reports, et cetera, when I have fewer to grade. So, you know, from the teacher standpoint, how do you feel that, you know, what is the response that you're getting? Tim, what, you know, have you spoken with other teachers? Is that something that you've had a chance to get feedback on? I haven't really had much of a chance to talk with different teachers. We've, we've really only spoken with the homeroom teacher. With the, okay, okay. And Sarah, what, what are you hearing um, from teachers? You know, I haven't talked to that many teachers about how they're feeling this year. What I have heard from many is just overwhelming relief to, to be back in school, but also overwhelming exhaustion. Our teachers have been working double time since March of 2020, and they haven't stopped yet. And now yeah. they're figuring out how to get every kid what they need and heal after the pandemic, which is a whole different, enormous task to take on. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I know, definitely. Have, have teachers been quitting? I don't think so. We may have had more retirements than usual, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but we haven't had people just quitting left and right. Right. Okay. okay. Our teachers so are incredibly dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of support from the school too, I think. Um, having said that, so here is the, the comment on Reddit from um, someone saying, speaking from experience at the high school, I'd say it's going about as well as I personally was expecting it to. Kids have already tested positive, note kids, plural. Multiple teachers weren't in class for the first few days due to them or their family getting sick. Grading software didn't work for a while. Masks are off at lunch and usually stay off until an admin tells someone off. Every stairway is congested with people, which becomes a big problem when you've walked up five, five flights of stairs and are trying to suck all the air you can back into your lungs before the bell rings. Schedules and room assignments are confusing and students are expected to test themselves in the hallway as part of one class per week. 
on the plus side, the campus looks nice, <laughs> even though it isn't finished yet, despite promises of as late as August, if there were 20% more budget, because one of the other questions I asked is if you had 20% more money, what would you spend it on? This person says, I'd want a mandatory vaccination mandate for attendance and more free at school vax clinics. It would at least be something before the inevitable Delta shutdown in a month or two. So here's somebody who clearly thinks that there are going to be shutdowns, regardless of what other people are thinking. So, um, so there are definitely some glitches. Is that to be expected? Um, did either one of you encounter that? I mean, is that something, Sarah, that you've received any um, feedback on? Feedback I've gotten about the high school is parents concerned about the low um, consent rate at the high school, which I think is hovering around 50% and really wanting that to go up. I've gotten a little bit of pushback about the vaccine mandate we put in place regarding extracurriculars. I would just add that, you know, whereas all our elementary schools were fully in person at full capacity starting in March last year, and so really honed their routines around testing and what to do around positive cases, the high school didn't go back until May. The seniors didn't go back at all. There's a new principal this year, they're in a new building. So I think they're getting up and running in a way that the elementary schools already had practice doing. Yeah, so I would expect some of that to, to iron out. And I'll also say that there are a number of vaccine pop ups planned for the high school. Um, and if things don't improve, the school committee and district will be working to, to strengthen the vaccine mandates. Yeah. And one of the things I've been thinking about, you know, you just kind of think about World War II and what the sacrifices were that people made during that time. And I feel like this pandemic is kind of the same thing. And quite frankly, you know, that we, we, I feel like there is so much capacity um, for people um, to help out and particularly for kids who aren't as fortunate as um, Tim's um, child to have parents who are able to help them out. And so for these kids, kind of the lost kids, you know, is, you know, is there like a Rosie the Riveter um, core of adults who are in a position to tutor or help out at schools or something like that? Is that something that you at the school committee are talking about at all? And if so, what, what would something like that look like? So Somerville has a really robust volunteer program and it's really easy for adults in the community who wanna plug in to just go on the website, find the volunteer program and sign up. And the volunteer program is matching volunteers with classrooms and kids in ways that the teachers are requesting. And I think it's really important this year because like every other district around the country and many businesses, we're really struggling to fill positions. We have an enormous budget increase, tons of federal money, but it's very hard to find people to staff the position. So as much as adults in the community want to join the Rosie the Riveter Back to School Corps, they should definitely sign up um, for the Somerville Volunteer Program, which is really just fantastic. Is that something you think the mayor and the um, city council will be... Um you know, talking about, um, I mean, because really a lot of that is getting the word out. Do people even know that this is an option? And can we make this like a, a social contract, uh, you know, mandate, which is for us to be part of the part of the core, the education core? <laughs> I don't want to speculate on what the next mayor and the city okay. council will do, but I hope right. they would, right? I would hope that they're yeah. prioritizing prioritizing yeah. families and kids and what they need yeah. and uniting the community around that. Yeah, yeah. And Tim, what would have to change? Like, you know, I mean, obviously, so there is, you know, the state has said there's no remote option. Um, you know, what do you think would happen if, you know, and, and we only have a minute left. So what, is there anything that would make you make a different decision than decide to do homeschooling? Um, if, I mean, the, the, the contact tracing, uh, I think should be better, uh, right now it's a three foot, 15 minute, um, definition of close contact that I think is insufficient to capture, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, you know, transmissions. Um, if that, you know, uh, if I, if I start seeing, uh, in school transmission, which is actually really hard to get information about whether that's happening from the district, incidentally, uh, that would, that would make me change my mind. Um, if we start, uh, 
you know, if we find out, you know, new information that was different than what we've been told before about ventilation or how testing works, um, that could that could easily make me change my mind because we've we've gone back and forth so many times already. It's it's exhausting. Yep. Yeah, got it. Well, thank you. And I'm, um, I'm sorry, we're out of time. So I really want to thank both of you for sharing your um, knowledge and expertise. Um, we will continue to soldier on during these difficult times. And with any luck, um, you know, we'll just keep this at bay and things will work out. So thank you very much, both of you for um, joining us. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back in two weeks for the next edition of Somerville Livewire.